My name is Fred Dotson and welcome to Ask Me Anything 2022. Let's get right to it. The first question I received is from Ella and it is, have you or anyone you know ever regenerated or regrown new teeth? If so, what technique was used? I personally have not experienced regrown teeth either for myself or as a coach. I still go to the dentist like normal people. But I have experienced the impossible on many occasions. I've seen amputated limbs regrow. I've personally experienced and witnessed blindness disappear and return to eyesight. These two things would be considered impossible by so-called science, but I've seen them, I've experienced them. Events like these are the reason I am a reality creation coach and have great belief in the impossible. So while I haven't experienced the regrowing of teeth, I believe it's possible. Find someone who has experienced that and read about them. The next question is by Pierre and it's what do you think of the metaverse in general? It's a game like any other you identify yourself with a game, you get into it. If you identify yourself too much, you get lost in it. I think that's what may have happened with this physical reality, this earth plane. This physical reality itself could be a virtual reality that we incarnated to and we've taken the game a bit too seriously, got lost in it. And now, to get even more dense, even more trapped, as some would say, we've created a virtual reality within this virtual reality. And no doubt, someday there'll be another virtual reality within the metaverse. And that's how a soul becomes denser and denser. From my answer, you can tell I'm not interested in the metaverse. I'm interested in going back up, returning back to source, seeing the next higher realm and the next higher and the next higher. But no judgment if you're interested in games like that and identifying with different realities using the metaverse. Be my guest, or not my guest, be their guest. To me, we've already gone into virtual reality a lot. We already live in a more dreamlike reality because we're hooked to our screens and get our mostly false beliefs from the screen, hypnotized by the screen. That's already a step into that direction, which I'm not that fond of. Now, theoretically, you could use it for a positive purpose. You could use it by being very choosy, which virtual reality you identify with, and then taking that feeling you get from it back to this reality. But that's rare. The next question is, do 
You seem to be having a lot of fun. Is it frustrating or is it comical to see others struggle with the seriousness of life? That's a question by Tom. Good question. When I'm in a normal mood, I'm frustrated by it, frankly. And I ask myself, how is it possible that people have such limitations? Do they not know they are divinely created beings, created with such love and precision? Science could never create such a wonderful being. No AI can be so lovingly created, so brilliantly. Don't they know how much power they have because of that? And that sometimes frustrates me. Sometimes I'm amused. When I'm in a better mood, I'm amused and find it hilarious, comical. So it depends on mood, and I understand that people are frustrated and they look for people who read my work, they look for higher consciousness. And they get a glimpse of higher consciousness, a feeling for it, and then they look at the wor world and there's a contrast, and they get frustrated by that. But honestly, as you work on yourself and elevate in consciousness, you more and more see it as an amusing game. The next question is, in your book, Levels of Energy, you said that 530 is being surrendered to anyone in regards to anything. Can I be a 530 person and yet reject people's requests or demands that are not in accordance with my preferences? My response to that is, the attitude is still 400s. The, the rejecting and preference, as opposed to unconditional love, but it's healthy 400s, it's good. It's a quality I have taken from the 400s and still practice today, very strictly in fact. I very quickly cut out of my life people who lie to me, for example, instantly, because Life is fairly short, and I prefer to spend time with people who are honest. And that's very simple, and it saves a lot of trouble. You see, every level of consciousness has something good. And one of the misunderstandings people have from many authors that write on levels of consciousness is that you always have to ascend, and this level is better than that level. But every level has something useful you can derive from it. Even low level, such as anger, you can always take a little bit of anger, not much, just a little bit, to awaken yourself and others, you know. As in, if I say, stop, it is now enough. And that's not much anger, it's just a little bit of that ingredient. Likewise, I can take ingredients from every level and they'll be useful. I hope that helps. The next question is, from Alexa, and it is, do you think that we've accidentally summoned technology from another dimension? It mimics God, it watches, it gives, but it is void of feelings and love. When I try to feel it in its totality, it feels like a different entity that came from someplace else and is expanding rapidly. Well, my question back to you is, how is that of your concern? Why is that your focus? Because I think stuff like that happens all the time. Breaches. Uh, this Earth plane is a non-intervention plane where people are meant to be left alone and there's breaches of that. As I write in my book, The Pleiades and Our Secret Destiny, 
And where there's breaches, there's also cleanup crews. You see, this life game has been going on for a long, long time. And there's an organizing intelligence. Things are organized and there's reasons why things happen. And don't you think that this organizing intelligence has a plan B in case dimensions are breached? Dimensions, the, the, the non-intervention treaty is breached all the time. A nuclear bomb goes off and in that moment it opens a gate where negative entities can come in. Why, would, why anybody would detonate a nuclear bomb, I have no idea. What a dumb thing to do, you know. But uh, it happens all the time, and there's cleanup crews all the time. I believe in a higher realm, there's a job description, cleanup, cleanup crew. Do you want to be a earth cleaner? But way down there, there's earth. You want to help clean up. Pay is good. So yeah, that does happen. But it's taken care of, you know. All is well. That's my message, I guess. All is well. Next question is, from your viewpoint, what is the best way for me to prepare for tryouts for a specific sport or just leaving a good impression on the coaches? As long as you want to leave a good impression on the coaches, you don't. Instead, you should be focused on having fun doing your thing. Like back in the day when nobody's watching. Just having fun, focused on scoring. If that's your focus, you'll naturally leave a good impression. The next question is from Justin. How do I become more proficient in answering my own questions? Such as step one, gain confidence. Step two, quiet yourself. Step three, reflect. What does that process look like for you so that I may apply that to my own life? Justin, you are being, right now, in this question, too linear and too much in the mind, for sure. It's like asking me, what is the exact process for kissing? First you wet your lips and then you place your lips on the other's lip. You see what I'm saying? It's Something that comes to you naturally. You ask questions all the time. You ask others questions. Others ask you questions. And in this case, it's just you asking yourself questions and answering them. If you really need a process, check out my book, The Intuitive Awareness Method. The next question is, what is your opinion on animal consciousness? Do they have souls like us? Yes, they have souls, but not like us. <laughs> everything that moves, everything living has energy. Even inanimate objects have energy, but Animate ones also have consciousness, awareness. A plant is aware of what's going on in its surroundings. Animals have different purposes and different consciousness. They're not equal to humans. They have other purposes, but yes, they have personality, unique personality. Anything that has personality has a soul because personality is the soul. This question is from Johannes and it's, it's, do you touch on polarity in any of your work? Yes, I touch on polarity in my work. The guided meditations you find on my website in the members section, almost all of them involve polarity, a focusing on Preferred, not preferred, this side of, of an issue, that side of an issue, back and forth. To reach a state beyond polarity. The
The next question is from Paul, and it is, I love my girlfriend and told her so. That's good. But at the same time, I keep fantasizing about other women. I also have logistical doubts about the relationship. For example, I worry that the time that would be best for her to have children is not the time it would be best for me to have children. What should I do? Should I solve this within myself or should I bring this out into the open and start expressing these sorts of things to her? You were lovingly and divinely created to procreate. So it's normal that you would have sexual fantasies that drive you to have sex. You're made that way. It's quite normal. Sexual fantasy points to loads of creative energy. You see where I'm going with this? You can either waste that creative energy on only sex and sexual thoughts, or you can redirect it instead of suppressing it, you can, or shaming yourself about it, you can redirect it into work and productivity and creativity. You can actually release the sexual thought, and I talk about releasing a lot in my guided audios on my website, as well as my seminars and videos. You can release thoughts as they come up. It's your choice. You choose whether to focus on these thoughts more or to release them and use that energy for work. That's something you have the power to do. You don't have to suppress the energy or feel bad about it or ashamed. And that might be the even better option than going to your girlfriend and saying, I'm troubled by all these fantasies of other women, just let go of them and redirect your focus. I'm not sh saying you shouldn't express yourself. But even better than expressing yourself is to release that which troubles you, if it troubles you. And if it's too much sex thinking, there's something you can do about it. You are responsible for your thoughts. Also, not all thoughts have to turn into actions. They're just thoughts. But if we keep thinking the thoughts, that's reality creation, eventually the body's going to want to act on it. That's what reality creation is about. You think it over and over and over and over and over and over, eventually you're going to act on it, if it's combined with emotions. <clears throat> As for the children, that's something I would certainly express. Express your viewpoint and give her space to express her viewpoint. One of the most powerful things humans can learn is to be okay with two contradicting viewpoints, to give two contradictions the space to just be. Because if we give those contradicting views space and allow a contradiction to be there without resistance, eventually it dissolves into something higher, into a win-win. I know that's an overused word, but it's very, very valid. There's always an option, a higher option, that both are very pleased and very happy with. That's how I do my relationship. For example, the chair I'm sitting on, both me and my wife had to be 100% happy and pleased with it, otherwise we don't get it. Otherwise, there's no decision until there's 100% satisfaction in me and the partner. I do the same in my relationship to customers. There has to be 100% satisfaction in me and the customer, or any relationship at all. 
there's always a higher solution that you don't see yet. But before you see that, both of you have to be allowed to have your position and to express it to each other. The next question is, how can I be a mother and work outside of home? I have many beliefs about this issue. How can I overcome them? This is by Noor. Well, Noor, um, write down all of your beliefs. List them on a piece of paper. Take note of whether these beliefs you have are from you or from someone else. And maybe from who. And also list for every thought that you wrote down what you would like to believe instead of these things. And then imagine being happy as a stay-at-home person and also imagine being happy as a going-out person or a working person because you have resistance on both sides. You have problems with staying home and problems with going out and you need to find non-resistance and happiness with both sides so that you can imagine being perfectly happy staying and perfectly happy going. There's many solutions that could come up if you clear your energy. Much help from others. Many solutions that we don't see because we have too many thoughts and beliefs in front of it. All right. The next question is from Andrea in Italy saying, Lately I'm spending more time taking care of my health, eating healthy, meditating, sleeping and working out, and less time working. Good. I feel better overall, but I also feel a bit guilty. How do I know if I'm not working enough? Or if I just need to let go of that sense of guilt? The hidden assumption in this question is that healthy living, meditating, sports, and sleeping does not align with productive work. So that's the I must work slave program. And if I don't constantly work, I'm not productive, but it's not true. It's an addiction. Many people have this addiction. Uh, it's not true. If you balance it with self-improvement, you can work much longer and much more creatively. Your work then becomes more smart and less hard. I have a lot of time outs throughout my work day. I go for a swim in my pool, I browse around in the internet, I read a nice book, spend time with my wife, um, go for a walk, look at something beautiful, meditate. I have a lot of go, go to work out, go play tennis, and all these time outs actually serve my work greatly. I become much more productive and creative with better ideas, whereas if I'm only focused on work all day, and this applies to everybody, I get into a rut, a routine, just doing the same routine every day, and nothing new happens, and work gets increasingly difficult. So, you have that belief, drop it, get rid of it, say, I cancel this belief, Knowing that putting attention elsewhere gives you new ideas and you can bring them into your work. You're not a slave, you're not an animal, you're not a robot. The next question here is, it seems that I'm unable to find my natural joy. I meditate daily, but it's as if there's always a new fear, worry, boredom, uncertainty that prevents me of being fully relaxed concentrated and at one with everything. How am I 
to let my natural joy come out. There's a reason, there's a reason for the state's boredom, worry, fear. You're trying to suppress them so that you can meditate. But there, there's a reason you have these states. It's either something you're thinking or doing that is not in alignment with your joy, with your soul. Your soul is your joy. And perhaps meditating itself is not in alignment with it. I know that sounds controversial, but just because meditating brings me joy, brings me closer to myself, doesn't mean that applies to you. Find the things that already, without effort, and forcing yourself into some discipline, without effort, bring you joy. What are these things that bring you joy, that make your heart smile? I'm not talking about pleasure, I'm talking about joy. Pleasure is one thing, joy is another. What things make your heart soft, make you smile inside? That's joy. There are things, maybe you've forgotten them. Maybe it's been a long time since you've done them. But it's your choice to remember them, think of them, and act upon them. The next one is, I have mixed feelings toward my dad. Resentment, pity, sometimes guilt, and sometimes love. How can I clear those emotions so it doesn't affect my future relationships? Understand that everybody has their reasons for being the way they are. And from their perspective, they think they're right. If you put yourself into the perspective of your dad, he probably has a completely different belief system than you, and he has reasons for believing what he believes and doing what he does. Even bad people so-called bad people, have reasons. They have belief constructs that make them think and behave that way. One way to create understanding is to put yourself into another's shoes and try to understand that person, what motivates them, why are they the way they are. It's a good exercise, shifting your viewpoint. In addition, I recommend the uh, releasing audios on my website, and if you don't have access to those, you can go to my YouTube channel and do releasing resentment on the topic of your father. It's a video posted a couple of weeks ago, and another one is about guilt, also on my YouTube channel, and you run those two a few times, and that should improve and change the atmosphere and energy. The next question is, have you experienced the midlife crisis? If so, what did you do to process the overwhelming thoughts and feelings? Midlife crisis is just another belief system, just another concept. It's not a reality. There's so many belief systems given to us through the media, through magazines, through television, through schooling. It's a constant brainwashing with things that don't exist. But they do exist as thought forms in the field. And sometimes we latch onto them and resonate with them and other times we reject them. I have rejected the idea of midlife crisis, so midlife crisis does not exist for me. I don't even know what it is. No idea what that means. My relationship to age, my true belief about age, is that the older I get, the more wise, the more strong, the more clear I get on who I am and what I prefer. Isn't that a wonderful belief about aging? 
And in fact, because that's my belief, that's exactly my experience. With every year that goes by, I feel better and more clear and more authentic. It's wonderful. There's no way, if I could, if I were given the choice to be 30 again or 20, there's no way I'd want to go back to that mentality. Aging also helps us realize there's a, going to be a time where we once again ascend to that afterlife higher realm, and that's wonderful. A lot of people talk about life extension, wanting to have eternal youth. I don't want that because it would mean staying in this realm. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't mind seeing something else too outside of this, you know. So that's my relationship to aging. I don't know what midlife crisis is. I recommend you see the benefit of every age, no matter what age you are. If you're in your 50s, there's benefits to that, 40s benefits, 30s benefits, 60s benefits. Find the benefits of each age. The next question is by Ash, and it's, what is the best technique for a person to achieve all his goals of marriage, money, and relationships, knowing that he has been in this field for about 10 years and has not made much progress in his goals? What would this technique be? I'm currently almost daily imagining myself that I own all the things, relationships, and money that I want. Well, Ash... what this feels like and sounds like. Imagine me wanting to learn swimming and I'm sitting in front of the swimming pool visualizing that I can swim. So I'm structuring my consciousness, preparing my consciousness, but I'm not actually jumping into the water. Does that make sense to you? Of course not. The only thing that makes sense if you want to learn swimming is to go into the water. And that requires a little bit of a risk, a little bit of a stepping outside of my comfort zone, jumping into the water. After I've structured my consciousness, I want to act upon it and experience something in physical reality. Much of this, uh, these so-called techniques are actually used as avoidance, avoidance of real life experience. And people think I teach this kind of new agey teaching, but I don't. It only seems that way, but that's not what I teach. I teach that you have to get out of your comfort zone and do it, take action and experience it. And that always requires some courage. For example, you say marriage, are you just sitting at home visualizing marriage or are you actually hanging out with attractive people that would interest you? You see, that requires some courage. It's not a virtual reality. Are you, uh, you say money. Are you providing a product that is of value to people or a service that is of value that they would give you money for? Again, that requires your creativity. You have to step out of your comfort zone. The universe wants you to grow and expand. It does not want you to just sit inside visualizing. It wants you to use your word, thought, word, and action, as I say in my books, not just your thought. If you just use your thought, it stays a thought. Thought, word, action. Those are the three elements of reality creation. As I've taught in many, 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 many seminars and many books. All the best. This is Doug saying, is there really such a thing as good and evil or are they just constructs of the mind? Yes, there is such a thing as good and evil. I know that there's many New Age-ish philosophies, again, that say there's no such thing as good and evil. 
But if that's what you believe, then there's also no such thing as health and sickness, success and lack of success. So I can't really teach that because I'm a success coach. And I have to teach this is better than this. You see? However, uh, my teaching is not strictly black and white. It's many, many levels of good and evil. Many, many levels of positive and negative. That's why I wrote the book Levels of Energy. And this distinction is so important. That's why I wrote three books on it. And I explain what I'm explaining to you here in these books. I recommend you read them. They're um, so important because in the world you only have two, posi two positions. One is there's no good and evil, you know, it's just your label. Um, and while labels do affect your perception of whether something's good or bad, there's also inherent good and bad. Then there's the other position, the opposite, which sees everything as just good and evil, just black and white. That's wrong too. There's many nuances and levels and Good and evil also depends upon where you are on the scale. If I'm at 200, 300 will help me. If I'm at 500, then 300 will not help me. So I refer you to the book Levels of Energy. You, you also ask if the world is 50% positive and 50% negative, is that true for every moment of our lives? Well, of course not. No. My life is 99% positive because I've chosen it to be, because I'm familiar with how it works. The next question is by Maya, and it's, I would like to know what's the difference between a heart desire and an indoctrinated desire. A picture or an assumption I made through surfing and social media comparing my life with others, etc. Well, for example, I switch off my internet and social media every weekend from Friday afternoon to Monday morning. It's all switched off. There's no electronics at all in my life. And the reason I did that is because I need to come back to myself and feel who I really am, independent of the screen. The influence of the screen is too big in our life. We lose track of who we are because the screen is full of thoughts and beliefs. But what are my thoughts? What are my true beliefs? Who am I? That's how I do it. The next question is, I'm in a reality that I can't stand. Narrow box in a very narrow box and people are limited and time flies in boring routines. I want to change it, but there are people I love. How do I move to a broader reality full of beautiful adventure places and people without running away of losing beloved people? I don't want to fight. I want beautiful, easy changes. Do not blame others for not being fully authentic. If you are who you really are and gradually go in the directions you really prefer in your heart, the people you love and the people that love you will accept it. Even if they get upset at first, they will accept it and they will support you and move with you. Even if they estrange themselves from you at first, if they really belong in your life and there's really love, they will want contact with you. In fact, being authentic, in fact, being authentic means you will attract even more authentic relationships with them or with new people. The next question is, I would like to know your opinion about the world religions. If they're really authentic, why do they promote the idea that if we didn't follow their instructions, like killing, adultery, stealing, etc., we will go to hell? Instead of just saying, you reap what you sow and like attracts like. I recommend you read my books 
Levels of Heaven and Hell and Journeys in Spectral Consciousness, apart from Levels of Energy, actually the whole level series, which is five books, uh, then you'll see it's not the religions that promote these things, it's the inversion, uh, perversion, diversion of spiritual teachings. The wrong emphasis on certain misunderstood concepts. So there are levels of consciousness, um, <clears throat> many levels of consciousness, and stealing and murder reduce your level of consciousness. In that sense, you create your own hell. You're not punished and put to hell, you create it yourself. You descend. Murder has consequences. And that is like attracts like. So the religious teaching and the law of attraction teachings that you put against each other, you juxtapose, are actually teaching the same thing. It's in the way things are taught that the distortion, the inversion comes in. Do you understand? The next question is, what is your take on alternate history? I wasn't going to answer that question because I normally ignore questions and I have ignored a lot of questions that show a ignorance of my work. Uh, but I do like to advertise my website www.falsehistory.net where you see my take on alternate history. And there's loads of questions here. What's your take on the law of attraction where it's obvious uh, they've never read a single one of my websites or books, you know, and this is similar. My take on alternate history, I post about it all the time. Look, look before you ask. This question comes from Wally, and it's how do levels of energy and personality models that categorize certain traits into different groups fit together? Honestly, Wally, ever since I know levels of consciousness, I quit using personality models. Not that they're wrong, but they're limited. Whereas levels of energy, levels of consciousness goes to the essence gives me the essence, the energy, and it's from the essence, the seed, that we can predict roughly which direction things are going with certain people, places, things. So if I know that, if I know essence, why do I need secondary traits? I don't really, so I don't use them. This question is from Arnaldo, and it's, do you think the overall energy level of planet Earth is changing right now for the better? It's a smart question. Rather than better or worse, at the moment, what we're seeing in the world is a divergence, a great divergence of attitude, which in a recent article of mine titled, Are We Heading for Utopia or Dystopia? I address exactly this question, because I think it's a smart question. I say, never before has there been, or in recent history, has there been a greater difference between the hive-minded dystopian people and the individualistic and conscious utopian people, truly utopian people, because the dystopians actually advertise utopia the most, but they're not leading us toward utopia. It's only a veneer, a pretense. So the people who talk about utopian ideals the most are the least likely to, to deliver them. 
And these days, people got to watch out and be very conscious because thoughts manifest more quickly. But it's a time of opportunity to become much more authentic. Next question is, what is that criteria to ascend or descend? Is it to follow religions and their orders as written in their books, or to be free of them and live as a conscious, loving human? There's again the uh, attempt to put this against this, to divide the two. And the world is full of fake divisions like that. This is not really a, really a question, it's more of a statement because you already, in your question, say this side is conscious and loving and this side is religion. So you're already answering the question yourself and that's your belief. However, I say that it's a false dichotomy. Mm. The ancient teachings that you call religion, the books themselves, do teach how to be conscious, free, and loving. It's the inversion, perversion, diversion of these books that we call religion. There's a difference, and I'd like you to notice the difference between these books and between religion. There's a difference between what the books say, a huge difference, and what the churches, mosques, synagogues, temples say. There's a worldly teaching, and then there's an actual essence, and they couldn't be more different. And I've talked about these differences in my books, particularly levels of heaven and hell. So, nothing against the books. The books are great. They teach you to be conscious and loving. So these are, again, not polarities. And most things are like that. They're not really polarities, you see. They're just made that way by the mind. Next question is by Jose. And as what is your advice, your roadmap, for someone who has too many pockets and too much time vibrating at the level of fear or unsatisfied desire, 100, 120? My roadmap is the book Levels of Energy. I, everything I say in there is what I say about fear and how to transcend it. And I say it again in my video, How to Stop Fear, that you can find on my YouTube. And you run that a few times on a fear, and the fear disappears. But there's a reason for the fear, first of all. It's because of, of a thought, intention, or action that does not fit to you. So instead of getting rid of the fear, you want to get use the fear as an indicator of what's, what thought is not for you, what's not working. Your next question is, tell us about the symbology of a covered eye. The eye on top of the pyramid, the horn. Are these symbols of power? Are these dark symbols? I've also discussed that in my book, Levels of Heaven and Hell. There's many, many aspects to it. Uh, traditionally, in ancient times, never mind current pop culture, but in ancient times, there was one side, they thought the all-seeing eye is the eye of God, and there's another side that says the one eye is the eye of Satan. So these are two opposite polarities. And then there's people who believe that this is uh, Satan or Lucifer, and if they pay allegiance to that, they can get, gain success in life, worldly success, like sell your soul to the devil, right? And then they use these symbols to show their allegiance. However, none of this has anything to do with reality creation. 
which is success without strings attached. That's one of the reasons I created Reality Creation, because the philosophy of the world is that success comes with strings attached. And if you want to go all religious, you could say that's a variation of Satanism, that success comes with strings attached, of the old ways of, you know, okay, I'll sacrifice a chicken, or even worse, I'll do a human sacrifice for my success. And believe it or not, there's still people today that think that way. And of course, it's nonsense. You don't have to compromise your integrity for success. You see how I've turned your question into a positive message? You have a third question. What is your opinion about neurofeedback or other devices to go above 100 so that the brain comes out of fear? Well, maybe your fear is because you focus on negative things such as uh, the horn and the eye. <laughs> then if you shift your focus to something you prefer, something good, true, and beautiful, something pleasant, you won't need any neurofeedback devices. I prefer to teach reality creation without strings attached, and that includes machines. Machines are also strings attached. No judgment, neurofeedback is good and has some use, but it's still a little bit of a string attached. Don't you know who you are? Don't you know that you're a divinely, lovingly created human being who has the power to change your, your state? Know who you are, Jose. I believe that my tools can blow out a specific fear within minutes. Not all fear. That's delusional because fear has a purpose to show you when your thoughts are not fitting to you. So you can't blow out all fear, you can blow out specific fears as they arise. The next question is how to be happy after you lose one of your parents. How to be happy after you lose one of your parents. First of all, it's okay to miss your parents in the first uh, weeks and months. I don't know why you'd want to be happy if you miss them. You don't have to be happy all the time. It's a typical, again, new ageism. There's all these false teachings out there in the self-improvement movement. Um, you have to be happy all the time. You put a smiley face on things. You can grieve for a couple of weeks and allow yourself to feel down. That's okay. But eventually, um, you find a sense of peace, maybe not happiness, but peace with your parents when you know that death is simply a trip to another place, usually a more beautiful place. So that's not something to be too sad about. If they're doing well, if they're at a better place, you can bless them. You can say, I wish you well. I love you. May you be well, and as you keep doing that, every time you think of them, every time you think of your parents uh, or your parent, I wish you well, may you be well, uh, may you have protection from the highest source. Every time you do that, you start rewiring your mind instead of every time you think of your parent, oh, poor them, poor me, it's I wish you well, I wish you well. Blessings to you, peace to you. And then you start feeling better. You know, people are ignorant of what happens in the afterlife. They haven't been taught correctly. And that's why they're so very sad, too sad, and sad for too long. If they knew how life works, they wouldn't be sad. They'd realize that's just the way it is. That's the cycle, birth and death. 
normal. It's a trip, quite a trip. And you'll see one day that it's not that dramatic. You'll see them again. After you leave your body, there they are. They'll probably come pick you up. The next question is, Fred, how did you start with reality creation to become what you are today? As a divinely created being, and that seems to be a theme of this video, it's not that I became a reality creator, it's that every person is born with these skills and qualities and abilities. And it is only through intense brainwashing in school and in society, and especially the media, that we forget who we really are. That's the game. I get born with a lot of skills that I don't have to train. Okay? They're already there. I don't have to learn them. don't have to train them. They're a gift to me by birth by virtue of me being part of the divine. And then through intense conditioning, we forget who we are. So the better question would be, how did you stay not brainwashed? It's because I didn't enjoy school. I didn't pay attention in school. Lucky me, I didn't pay attention. I sat there thinking, oh, this is boring. This is nonsense which probably means that I was born with this task, having enough energy not to be brainwashed. But it took a while for me to trust that. I had all this knowledge from the beginning, and the brainwashing is so intense that it took a while, and it went step by step knowing my powers and my abilities, and you too have these powers and abilities. And that completes Ask Me Anything 2022.